Welcome back to Jacques in the Garden. Today is one of my favorite days of the year because it is the day that I start my tomato and pepper seeds. Now I do have some new selections, some old ones. I'm gonna go over why I chose the ones I did and also why I might have removed some other ones. Now there are a few new varieties in here that might solve a specific problem that I have. So I'll be sure to mention that. I'm going to be mixing it up and doing a combination of the peppers and tomatoes all at the same time. So I'll be doing tomatoes on this side and peppers on this side. So let's get started with the first tomato. This is one that I actually grew for the first time last year. It is the Italian heirloom from Seed Savers Exchange. Now this one did really well for me. Not only was it a nice sized fruit, maybe like the size of an apple or so, but they were also quite productive. Now the first pepper we're going to be putting in today is a shishito pepper. They're really wonderful for snacking on, but they blister up really nice and they are a great snacking pepper you put out on the table as an appetizer for your guests. You can even make like a little spicy aioli or a soy lemon garlic aioli and people are gonna eat it up. I guarantee you they're gonna be happy with it. Over here we have the new 16 cell trays and we met up with this guy who grows a ton of peppers for retail that he sells to customers online and he grew all of his peppers in these tiny sized little cells. So we figured if it works for him, it should work for us. So what I'm going to do is put my peppers in here. In theory, that actually should work really well because it's a smaller volume of soil. So it's less likely to get overwatered, which is a problem with peppers. And it'll be easier to keep warm on a heat mat because there's less soil volume to actually heat all the way up to the top. Sugar Rush Peach, a classic one that I've been growing in my garden now for a few years. This is Save Seed, it's an heirloom pepper. This one's very interesting because it has extremely thin walls. Very, very thin and it has a lot of tropical flavors and actually packs quite a bit of heat. And in fact, we don't get plenty of heat at all. Sometimes summer does not come until maybe July or even like August. So if you live in a colder climate, sugar rust peach, fantastic pepper. Let's get in a tomato. This is a new one to me. It's one I grew last year. It's a indeterminate cherry tomato that is called Gardener's Delight. It makes a really nice sized cherry tomato, I have to say. They're not that small. They're actually like a little bit more sizable and they're great in a salad. They cut up really nice. You could cut them into quarters. They also roast up really nice in the oven. You could caramelize them. Really wonderful. They aren't just sweet. They are sweet, but they also have a little bit more complexity to them. When there's too much sweetness and not enough of other things going on, it's actually not a desirable tomato for us here. We don't want just to be hit with sugars. Now, some people of course love that and that's totally fine. But if you are not into that, I will be choosing tomatoes pretty much that are all balanced. Now let's get in another pepper that does really well in a colder climate and that is the early jalapeno. We grew these last year and this single jalapeno plant probably produced on its own well over 50 peppers and we love jalapenos. Sometimes we eat a lot, sometimes we don't, but having three plants was a little bit overwhelming for us. So this year I'm gonna actually sow two cells but the end goal here is to only put in two plants max. So two seeds in the 16s and some seeds in the six cells. So here's another new pepper to me. This one, New Max Lemon Spice Jalapeno. It has more citrusy tones to it. Jalapeno is already delicious, but if you add a little bit of citrus to it, I'm gonna think it's even more delicious. And this was no exception to that rule. So I'm definitely going to be starting up more of these. Another one that's quite unique is the Chiliano or Chilano. We got this from Seed Savers Exchange. It has this really interesting gradation of color. When it comes to spicy peppers, I will grow maybe a couple truly hot peppers, but I don't want a pepper that I can only put one of in the meal I'm cooking, because then I just feel like you lose a lot of those other flavors that I'm really trying to enjoy, like the tropical notes. And this is one of those peppers that in my mind is quite well balanced, and it's another one of those peppers that is very productive in my climate. All right, now we are back in tomato land, and I have my favorite tomato of all time, especially when it comes to slicers, and that is the Cherokee Purple. Now I am growing the Cherokee Carbon, which is a hybrid of Cherokee Purple with, I believe, the Carbon Tomato. And of course, I'm always gonna grow the heirloom version. Now, one of the interesting things is, is that a hybrid isn't necessarily going to do better for you. It might do better for you. Sometimes the heirloom will do better for you. So I like to plant both, because whatever is going on in the climate, I can't predict it but I just like having both options available. So again, Cherokee Carbon, the heirloom, or the hybrid version of the heirloom Cherokee Purple, both are gonna do well for your garden either way. I highly recommend you guys try them if you haven't. In terms of peppers, this is one that I have opened the packet on, but I don't remember ever growing it. This is the New Max Joe E. Parker Anaheim Chili. Anaheim chilies I actually really like. They have a really crisp crunch to them. They can be spicy, they can be stuffed, they can be eaten raw, you could cook them, saute them. So it's not going to be a crazy spicy pepper. It's gonna be well-sized. and It's gonna give you a lot of versatility in the kitchen. Now here in San Diego, we have this issue called powdery mildew. I know it affects plenty of other growers across the nation, but here it's particularly bad. 
So I like to grow at least one powdery mildew resistant variety. This Granadero plum tomato has been quite reliable for me here. It will produce even if it does have powdery mildew. And of course it does taste great, which is my main concern. Even if it was resistant, I wouldn't grow it if it tasted like nothing. So just keep that in mind that if I am growing these, unless they are new to me and I'm not sure what they taste like, I know that they taste good. That's the reason why I chose them. And that is the reason why I continue to grow them. Now, another tomato here that's new for me from Johnny's, this one is called uh, the Harvest Moon. It is an orange tomato. And I've never really tried orange tomatoes. I've heard that this one is actually quite tasty. So I'm just curious to get a little of new color in the garden. I try not to get too many new varieties, even though there's so many out there that I'd love to try. So I am trying to limit how many new tomatoes I introduce to the garden every year. Now there is one tomato that I am growing that is actually mostly sweet and low acid, and that is the Sweetie Cherry. This one can be really fun to play around with. It is a great salad tomato if you have a more like vinegar based uh, dressing that you're gonna be putting on it. It could also um, sun dry nicely because it has a lot of sweetness to it, even though it is quite a juicy tomato. But I do want a couple sweet ones, even though I said I try not to go to many sweet ones. So let's get a few of these seeds in and there we go. All right, one of the peppers that we have been apparently severely lacking in the garden is a Fresno pepper. But basically a Fresno pepper is maybe similar size to a jalapeno. It develops a nice deep red flavor usually when you harvest it. You can of course harvest it green if you chose to, but they have a really, really wonderful peppery, like a true red pepper flavor with some spice to it. And so just for her, I'm gonna be putting in quite a bit of seed here because I think she's expecting me to put in at least six plants. So I'm gonna put two seeds there. I'm gonna put six seeds across these cells and we'll see where we end up. Now, as I mentioned, I don't grow a lot of hot peppers, but I do grow some that have great flavor and the Scotch Bonnet is one of those peppers. And of course it is a very famous Caribbean pepper. So I am planning on making a little bit more hot sauce this year. I thought it would be fun to include a truly hot pepper because sometimes when you end up making your sauce, ferment it all the way, it can actually end up being not that spicy. So I wanna make sure that it is actually gonna have a kick and at least one pepper that's in that 100 to 300 range Scoville units, so quite hot here is going to be the key to getting that heat in the hot sauce. This tomato is one that I've saved seeds from myself. It is actually the short form that you see on my YouTube channel on how to save tomato seeds, where I grew a two and three quarter pound tomato. These are the seeds right here. So I'm very excited to be growing my very own gigantic seeds that I've been saving and cultivating. It should have good germination because I did properly ferment the seeds. I did properly dry them. So I followed all the right protocol when it comes to collecting tomato seeds. So I'm only gonna put two per cell here and I feel pretty confident they will actually germinate. So over here, we have a pepper. This is the uh, ahi uh, mojo pepper. It's another one of the tropical peppers that I'm curious about. It's something that I've always heard, but I haven't really tried. These are just ingredients that you can't find anywhere. You can only find them in your garden, and truly having your home garden is a really, really wonderful hack for somebody who loves to cook. Let's get another tomato on the ground. This one is a determinate tomato. This is called Red Pride. I did grow it last year, it produced quite well for me and I really like the shape of it. These like more rounded sort of smaller tomatoes, they don't roll around like a Roma tomato would. So they're really ideal for stuffing, cooking, cutting, whatever you wanna do with them. And that is why I always choose to grow some round determinate tomatoes. Another determinate tomato that is a, of course, a classic that everyone recognizes is the Roma bush. There are of course varieties like the San Marzano, which is a indeterminate, but the determinate version is just called like a Roma or plum tomato. And the reason why these are so great for cooking is that they tend to have very little water in them. What that means is that if you're making a sauce, you could cut these up, throw them in the pot, and they won't take hours and hours and hours to actually reduce down to the nice, thicker consistency that you're looking for in a tomato sauce. So that is kind of the main reason you would choose a plum tomato, is that they are not as watery. They're also great on sandwiches for that same reason, that they're not that watery, so they're not going to make a soggy sandwich, especially if you're like packing one to take on a hike. Now, this is a very unique pepper. This is one that I have grown before and it did pretty well for me. It's a variegated pepper. It's called the Candy Cane Chocolate Cherry Pepper. So quite the name there, but it is quite sweet and it's extremely crisp. I remember this one having um, pretty thin walls, which I don't mind having thin walled peppers. They're great for making salads. They add a nice crisp crunch to it or something where you're just eating them fresh without um, requiring too much chewing or overpowering the rest of the meal that you're making. So. Great pepper if you're looking for a nice, sweet, thin walled pepper that's also a conversation starter, this guy is for you. This is another one of the new tomatoes that I've added to my garden this year, and it is called the 
Candy Bell. This is a uh, grape style tomato. That means it's kind of like the more elongated tomatoes that aren't quite round, but they're maybe like a little bit more stout and uh, how do I say it, elliptical. The way I deal with diseases in the garden is that I don't really treat them with chemicals. I try to treat the soil first, try to rotate my plants more, but sometimes it's just hard. Sometimes you have a season where, for example, you don't have enough sun, you have too much moistness in the air, and you get fungal diseases. Another new one for me, I actually do have quite a few new ones this year, is the uh, very funny named cream sausage bush tomato. This is a determinate tomato, which is why it's called bush, and apparently can make a nice yellow pasta sauce. So that'll be interesting to play around with. And uh, I love having determinate tomatoes because the obligation to grow them is much less. What I mean by that is that they don't stick around in your garden forever. A indeterminate tomato, I can put it in the ground right now and basically leave it until December if I really chose to. But the determinates, they will set their crop, you will harvest it, and then you can harvest out that bed and put something new in. So I like having a mix of both. So I don't feel trapped. Obviously I could remove <laughs> the indeterminate tomato at any time I wanted to, but reality is that I'm just not good at doing that. I don't like removing plants unless I need to. This is one of these peppers that every single year I'm going to be growing no matter what, and that is the Escamillo pepper. It is from Johnny's. It is, I think, one of their exclusive varieties. And for me here in San Diego, it does do well in my climate, it has less issues with like bacterial spot on the peppers, things like that. And it just seems to produce a little bit more vigorously than any of the other similar style peppers that I've grown. So that is one of the reasons I'm growing it and one of the reasons I continue to grow it every year. Now this is a one that I grew last year I saved the seed from. It is the Laisa pepper. It is oftentimes called the most sweet pepper in the world. Honestly, what was kind of weird is that ours, for whatever reason, maybe the seeds that we got weren't actually that great, came out a little bit spicy. Actually, some of them were very spicy, but they were also still very sweet. So for me, I actually found that to be really interesting and actually a little bit of a bonus. So I did save the seeds from them. We're gonna grow them out this year and see if it is actually still truly a mix of spicy and sweet because they are an extremely thick wild pepper, one of the thickest wild peppers I've seen. Now, if there is one cherry tomato that you guys could grow without fail every year, everyone's going to love, everyone who comes over is gonna to try to steal all your cherry tomatoes. That is of course the Sun Gold cherry tomato. These long, beautiful trusses are not just a image, they are a reality and they taste so good. One of the main reasons you won't see these at the store is that they actually crack very easily. So what that means is that for a producer, while they would sell well, they are very hard to deal with in terms of transportation post-harvest because they have very thin skins, which is actually a great pleasure when you're eating it because you don't get a bunch of skins in your mouth. You just get a nice, sweet, complex, tart pop of tomato flavor. They are more sweet heavy, but they're not just sweet. They have a lot of complexity in them. They're so good. Everyone who comes over to my garden, the first thing I do is I hand them a sun gold tomato when they're in season, and they're, I just look at their face. Basically their face is gonna tell you everything you need to know about this tomato. It is questioning, like where has this been my whole life? How could it taste so good? Where did you get this? What is it called? I'm like, look, if you want this, you're gonna just have to grow it in your garden because uh, you're not gonna really find this at the store. Occasionally I do see them at the farmer's market. If you guys need to taste it to believe it, do check your local farmer's markets. Sometimes they will sell them. Now over here, we have the Mad Hatter. This is a very funny looking pepper. I think I have one in the ground still. They're very, very delicious. It's vibrant, it's green. It looks totally happy in the winter time. Now over here, I have two tomatoes. I'm not gonna dwell on too much. I got these because they are nematode resistant. One is called uh, Lemon Boy Plus. It's a yellow tomato, which again, I have never grown, so I'm curious about. And the other one is Big Beef Plus. Now, usually I wouldn't get something like a big beef because they are a very standard sort of hybrid variety that you could see anywhere, but I am very curious about nematode resistance. I have been battling my nematodes here in the garden by doing a couple different things. One of those things is I've been applying crab shell meal, neem cake meal, and I've also been um, planting French marigolds in the soil where I have seen nematode damage. If you don't know what nematode damage is, basically they come up uh, at your roots they get in your roots, they cause these swells, these gowls on your roots, and uh, they look like knots. That's why it's called root knot nematode. And the thing that happens is basically it suffocates your plant. It stops the water from being able to transfer up into your plant. So you'll have a plant that's just sitting there. Maybe it's barely growing, and you're like, what the heck is going on with this tomato? It looks fine from above. But if you pull the roots and you take a look at them and you find all those big chunky knots, you've got root knot nematode. Best practice, first step, is to rotate. Do not plant tomatoes there again put them somewhere else that is free from nematode damage, or at least you haven't seen it there before. But otherwise, those things that I mentioned earlier are what I'm doing to treat it. 
I am also going to be trying these nematode resistant varieties. Earlier I mentioned the Bulgarian pepper that I got seeds from, from Bulgaria, but there's actually a available seed. It's called the Trevena Chushka, like I mentioned from Seed Savers Exchange. I have seen them actually pop up in a few different places. Now, what I will say is that I have tried growing these before. They didn't do as well as the Bulgarian seed. But that could be a climate difference of where I am versus where these came from. The Bulgarian seeds seem to do well, but I am going to be trying them again this year and putting them in a better spot in the garden because I would love to offer you guys somewhere at least to find these Bulgarian peppers because right now we just don't have them on botanical interest. Um, as much as I'd love to have them added at some point, they have to be a nice reliable pepper for people across a broad region. Now this is a Nassau or Cubanelle pepper. They're what is known as a frying pepper, which I've grown quite a few different types of frying peppers. But basically a frying pepper is something that you throw in the pan with a little bit of olive oil maybe. You could even do a dry if you truly chose to. You fry them up until they get all blistered and nice, and then you just eat the whole pepper like that, like a snack. It really combines the sweetness of the pepper, sometimes the spice of the peppers, with a nice sweet balsamic, the nice spiciness of raw garlic in there. Now this is a padrone pepper. Padrone peppers are similar to shishito peppers in the sense that sometimes they can be spicy, but most of the time they're not. I think that's something that people are starting to realize is that when you get these really nice varieties, they are truly exceptional and they can stand on their own without any adulterations or like mixing them into a meal to make use of them. Now we're gonna go over to a tomato again. This is one that I've had for quite a while now, but for some reason I just haven't grown it. It's been described as being quite delicious. Actually for them they said it's uh, one, two consecutive years in a row at the Seed Savers Exchange for delicious tomatoes. And that is I think why I originally bought it. It's called the Dester Tomato. It is a classic heirloom. I think Craig Lehulier, the tomato master himself, has mentioned this as one of his tomatoes that he always tries to grow. So that's enough praise for me. I'm gonna make sure I get plenty of seed here because the pack gets a little bit old. Now another classic here is the Orange Sun. I don't grow many bell peppers. I actually tend to not grow that many bell peppers because there's so many other interesting ones. Actually, I just realized this is the only bell pepper I'm growing this year. Now, of course, any bell pepper you can harvest as a green bell pepper, and that's a green bell pepper, or you can let it go full ripe. In this case, this is an orange one. There are red ones that will turn red that you could still harvest green. So you can control your destiny. You don't have to harvest it at full ripeness. You could harvest it in between ripeness, full green, full, full ripeness, beyond ripe, where it gets really sweet. You have full destiny and control of your ingredients that go into your kitchen and that you get to eat. So this next one is actually an eggplant. This is the Aenea eggplant. I have grown this now for a couple of years, but this one has a really, really incredibly creamy texture to it. It has a very beautiful skin. It is a sort of purple, yellow, malted uh, pattern to it. So that is the current lineup of tomatoes and peppers. Now, I won't lie to you guys, there's a good chance I'll be adding a couple secret ones throughout the seasons. Probably some more sweet peppers because I feel like I'm a little lean on that. And for sure I'll be adding at least one or two, maybe three more tomatoes. Now a quick note also that I wanted to mention is that once you get your seeds in, what I'm going to do is just use this as an example here since I have it. You want to cover the top with some more soil to ensure that they are actually well covered by moist soil and that'll increase your odds of germination. Now with peppers, 100% you're gonna to wanna to bring them in and put them on a heat mat. Now heat mats, technically totally optional. You don't need it, but the difference that you're going to get is quite dramatic. If you put these peppers in an unheated area, they will eventually germinate very slowly, very spottily. Maybe like one will germinate here, this one will germinate in two weeks, that one will germinate in three weeks. But if you put them on heat, they should all germinate within probably two weeks at the max, instead of like three to four weeks and there'll be a very spotty germination. So heat, important for eggplants and peppers. Tomatoes, they will benefit from the heat, they will germinate faster, but it's not going to be as critical as something like the peppers, especially since peppers can't handle sitting in too much wet soil, they will begin to rot, whereas tomatoes will grow faster and they can handle it. So that's my little advice for you guys. If you do have the space for a heat mat, definitely put the peppers on a heat mat. Tomatoes, if you don't have space, it's okay. It is preferred, they will grow faster that way. So the last thing I need to do here is make sure that, I actually write down all of these varieties in my notebook here. I made a dedicated page so I could keep track of all these different varieties throughout the year and know that I actually grew them every year when I look back. And then the next thing I need to do is cover these all with soil to make sure that they're well covered, have that great germination, put them somewhere warm, peppers are going on a heat mat. But that's it for this one, guys. Let me know if I missed any varieties or if you have questions about them and uh, what seed starting video you wanna see next. Thanks for watching, I'll see you guys next time.